Um, so we are the Zookeeper team. We evaluated the effects of COVID-19 on the San Diego Zoo Global Volunteer Program. Um, so we're going to introduce ourselves before we begin our presentation. Um, so my name is Callie. Hello, everybody. My name is Natalie. My name is Jasmine. Hello, I'm Brianna. And we are going to get started. So for some background, um, so due to the COVID-19 pandemic, San Diego Zoo Global, which includes San Diego Zoo, the Safari Park, um, a research institute in San Diego, all had to close their doors from March to June of this year. This in turn has suspended all in-person activities and has greatly affected the volunteer program. The shutdown has forced the volunteer program to adapt their training, socials, and all volunteer activities to being online or being able to complete from home. And so the goal of these activities is to keep volunteers active. By active, we mean allowing volunteers to gain volunteer credit in hours and also keeping them um, active and engaged, an active and engaged member of the volunteer community. So volunteer management as well as the volunteers are adapting to be an online community, which is challenging when the role of a volunteer for SDZG is typically done in person. So now I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of how we got to the purpose of our evaluation or to our objectives. So we were initially brought onto this project with our initial objective to evaluate why volunteers were not returning to volunteer on grounds. Um, this was post June, so they're post reopening. After getting in contact with our stakeholder, Ms. Ratch and getting access to the San Diego Zoo Global Roarback Survey, which is an annual survey that all volunteers or volunteers are sent out to complete. We noticed that there were some record lows for social cohesion, engagement, and feelings of safety. Um, also through this survey, there were already some questions assessing why volunteers weren't returning to volunteer on grounds. So after our preliminary analysis, we met with another stakeholder. Um, she also said that through her Roarback Survey, she kind of got a better idea of why volunteers weren't returning. and she expressed some new concerns with online engagement. So keeping people engaged amidst this adaptation into an online setting. So at the end of all of that, we gained some new objectives on top of our initial objective to evaluate volunteer activities before and after COVID to see if anything has changed or how it has changed and the social cohesion among volunteers. So the main objectives we finalized to evaluate were to describe the demographic characteristics of volunteers we wanted to get a better sense of the volunteer community, especially since the volunteer program doesn't currently have data on this. Some demographics we looked at were age, gender, race, employment, and different um, their current status, either prior to the closure or present. Um, we wanted to determine changes in volunteer engagement before and after COVID for both in-person activities and online activities, and which activities volunteers are most engaged with in the recent months. Um, lastly, we wanted to assess the close social cohesion of the volunteer community in the COVID-19 era. So this included um, assessing how volunteers felt about inclusivity between groups and attitudes towards people in groups. Um, we wanted to do this because as mentioned before, the Roarback survey presented low cohesion scores such as teamwork, feeling included, feeling respected. Um, these feelings were present in some people before COVID, um, like in person, um, but have become more apparent as the program moved online. To collect our data, we created a survey using Qualtrics. It was emailed to 1,120 volunteers. The survey was sent out on Thursday, December 3rd, and closed on Monday, December 7th. The survey itself was 60 questions long. We recognize that's a lot of questions. So uh, we utilized the blocks from Qualtrics to organize the questions into their respective categories. And we ended up with six main blocks. Uh, so for some volunteers, they skip certain blocks, so their survey was shorter. It all depends on whether they were an inactive volunteer, online volunteer, or an in-person volunteer. And in an effort to incentivize volunteers to fill out the survey, they were offered an hour of volunteer credit, and they were entered into a raffle. And fortunately, this worked out. We had a high response rate. The response rate turned out to be 59%, so 664 ended up submitting the survey, and from those volunteers, there was a 91% completion rate. So here is some demographic information about our volunteers. Um, so the mean age was 65 years old, but the youngest volunteer that filled out the survey was 19, and the oldest was 88. 
um, almost all of the volunteers that filled it out were white. Um, mostly female employment status was a majority retired, but 21% of volunteers are also working full or part-time. Um, education, a, a really um, large majority of the volunteers um, have a college degree or higher with 42% having a master's or a doctorate degree. And then a little over half of the volunteers have been volunteering for at least one year. Um, so between one to five, and then 36% have volunteered for more than five years. Um, so we have a very dedicated group of folks um, in the volunteer program. So now we're going to jump into a little bit of our data analysis. We're going to see how on-site in-person volunteering has changed amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're looking at in-person volunteering before the March closure, as well as after the June reopening. So prior to the March closure, 93% of respondents reported working on grounds. Callie mentioned this earlier, but many of the volunteer activities are pretty much in-person, whether they're interpretive volunteers, uh, working in guest services, or they are informational ambassadors. More than half of them worked at least once a week, so they're pretty regular at either the zoo or the safari park. After the June reopening, only 64% of respondents reported working on ground, so that's a significant decrease from before March. Um, but despite this decrease, the proportion of people who came back who work at least once a week is still the same, more than half. So what has happened with online volunteering throughout the year? Before the March closure, about 41% of volunteers engaged in online volunteering. Um, San Diego Zoo Global is a very large program and is more than just those who work on grounds in the zoo and safari park. So this did include those who normally volunteer online like out of San Diego or things like webcams, special projects. Um, between March and June during the closure, the rates did increase to 72% um, engaging in online activities. A third of them volunteered online at least a couple of times a month. And then the rates decreased once the zoo and safari park reopened. So 28% were active online only, and then 35% were active both online and in person. And almost half volunteered a couple times a month. So how many volunteers have par participated in online activities? We found that the most common activity was Zoom meetings with a 34% participation rate from March June, the closure and 33% after June. So Zoom meeting consists of both informative sessions or Zoom socials where volunteers can connect and communicate with others. Some examples are happy hours, listening circles, and um, things like that. The second most common was continuing education and collaboration, which is an online education program with 30% during the closure and 29% after June. When comparing the participation rate between the closure and at the reopening after June, the rates were pretty similar and stayed um, pretty consistent. So why haven't volunteers returned in person? Initially, we did a qualitative analysis on the Roarback survey for why people haven't returned on grounds and found some common themes. Um, some common themes we found were that people won't come back until there's a vaccine, until COVID is completely gone, um, they themselves or them, their families are immunocompromised or they're just not in San Diego to be able to volunteer. Um, we wanted to assess this question again. We reformatted it to fit what our previous analysis said and just to get a better picture of the rates. So from our survey, we found that 61% of people don't feel safe because of COVID-19. Um, this was a multiple like selection question. So people who did um, choose one of these options also could have picked other. Some of the um, reasons for other that we found were that they're out of town, they're restricting their volunteer to, they're restricting their volunteering to protect others' health, they're uncomfortable with either mask wearing or enforcing people to wear masks, or they are older age. Well, now we only did a brief glance of these qualitative data because we didn't have um, much time to do like a full analysis. In order to assess the social cohesion of the volunteer community, we needed to develop a quantifiable way to measure it, and this was difficult. But um, as we mentioned before, we approached it by focusing on a few key factors, and this question works to address their attitudes towards other volunteers. So from the 666 respondents, 71% felt it is very important or important to feel a sense of community with other volunteers. Uh, the question is asked in a way to measure the importance before COVID uh, led to the zoo and safari park closure. 
Uh, this next question is again assessing their attitudes towards other volunteers, but in terms of the impact COVID had on the zoo. So from the 666 respondents, 70% overall reported their feelings have not changed, but almost a quarter thought it is more important. Uh, we figured the more important answer option would have been higher because of uh, social distancing and the changes implemented to the zoo. Uh, but it seems like the circumstance doesn't matter as much uh, for at least most people. Um, having a sense of community in general is what they expect when volunteering. Uh, we also conducted a Zoom social assessment to, to assess how beneficial they have been. Uh, the, pro the program offers a variety of events on Zoom. They've held happy hours, listening circles, coffee talks, lunch hour socials. In the survey, we presented six statements. Um, each statement was assessed individually and respondents were asked to choose from the strongly agree to the strongly disagree scale. And almost all respondents thought the Zoom socials helped them feel connected and work to boost their morale. Reported benefits with mental health and inclusion was also high with over half a green. Uh, then a quarter felt like the Zoom sessions allow them to make new friends and acquaintances. Um, and so this was insightful because it shows that Zoom socials can and do shape the volunteer experience. So here are some limitations that we found in our evaluation. Beginning with limitations in our data collection, we feel that the sample may not be representative of the entire SDZG volunteer population, even though the response rate was 61%. This is all new information because the volunteer program has not collected demographic data yet. Um, so this is just a general assessment and we don't expect it to fully represent the volunteer population as a whole. For our second limitation, given that we haven't had extensive training or education on social cohesion as a theory, our knowledge has come solely from research we did online and there are different theories. So we feel the validity of our questions to assess social cohesion may be limiting because we interpreted one theory when there are many that exist. And then our first limitation that we felt as investigators was the pressure of our short turnaround time to analyze the data from the Qualtrics survey. The survey closed Monday evening, so we've been gathering data and analyzing it from the minute that survey closed. Um, but we do wish that we had more time to provide cross tabulations and analyses of how different groups of volunteers um, have different needs. And lastly, it was difficult for us um, as a group to quantify social and communication factors. We wanted to ensure that the survey was easy to comprehend while also ensuring that we got the information that we needed for our stakeholder. Um, and it was confusing at times to create a question and assign a number or a score to how included a volunteer felt in a Zoom call or how satisfied they were with the frequency of email newsletters. And now a few lessons learned. Um, after our evaluation, we wanted to make it a priority in our survey to not include any leading questions. And we took advantage of the San Diego Zoo Global Roarback Survey being distributed just a little over a month before we sent our survey out. And we intentionally included some questions that would allow the volunteers to expand on previous responses from the Roarback Survey um, that may have been worded in a leading way. And the second lesson we learned was to be weary of our study timeline. Referencing our timeline slide in the beginning of this presentation, our priority was constantly changing. Um, up until Monday, the main priority was just creating the survey, but in order to do that, we had to meet with our stakeholder, analyze the Roarback survey, and then receive feedback and change the objective to better fit our stakeholders' needs, and finally analyze the survey data. And that leads me to our final and possibly most important lesson. Um, it is so important to have a good relationship with your stakeholder and community members. And we were lucky enough to have Dr. Bacon as a mentor and a volunteer herself. Um, so we were able to have an inside perspective for the community members that this survey will be serving. Um, so we had to learn to be adaptable in order to best reflect the stakeholders interests so that she can take this data and best serve the volunteers. All right, and we're going to close out our presentation with some recommendations. So harking back to our first objective, which was to gain a better understanding of the volunteer community demographically, we would recommend conducting further analyses by age, gender, and other variables to determine if there are any possible differences between the needs of the groups. This can also apply to our third objective, which was aimed towards social cohesion. By finding these possible differences, there may be different needs between groups. And in that way, the volunteer program can kind of cater 
programs and accommodations to the different needs of different groups and that could help with inclusivity or feeling inclusive included. We also recommend holding more Zoom meetings. Um, this is kind of also playing on our third objective as well as addressing the interest of our stakeholder, which was online engagement. So volunteers participated in Zoom meetings more often than other activities. They also prefer to have Zoom socials in the future as opposed to other online activities. We also found in our data that Zoom meetings were more positive, positively received or uh, satisfied our older generation of volunteers more than younger. So maybe having age specific socials for people who value them more might provide more of a um, fulfilling space. We also recommend using different facilitation methods, experimenting with different facilitation methods to engage more people in Zoom meetings. So these can be things like polls or breakout rooms. Just from a brief scam of our qualitative data, uh, people have expressed that in the large Zoom meetings, it may be intimidating for them to unmute themselves and share. So by creating breakout rooms, that could also help create a space where people are more likely to participate. Um, we also noticed that some people have mentioned maybe they don't feel comfortable because they don't have enough space or they feel like they're not, they don't have enough space to talk in a Zoom meeting. So we recommend experimenting with setting community guidelines. That way there's an expectation for the group and in the meeting so people feel more likely or more comfortable including themselves or participating. Those are our recommendations. And thank you so much for listening to our presentation. A special thank you to Dr. B, Andrew, and Tammy Ratch, our stakeholder, for working with us throughout this quarter. Andrew for the analysis and Dr. B for the constant guidance. So thank you.